The Battle of Antietam is often called the most terrible battle of the age. The battle cost nearly 23,000 casualties and put a halt to Robert E. Lee's planned invasion of Maryland. Let's hear the soldiers' reactions to this legendary battle. Robert E. Lee before the battle. The present seems to be the most propitious time since the commencement of the war for the Confederate Army to enter Maryland. The two grand armies of the U.S. that have been operating in Virginia, though now united, are much weakened and demoralized. Their new levies, of which I understand, 60,000 men have already been posted in Washington, are not yet organized and will take some time to prepare for the field. If it is ever desired to give material aid to Maryland and afford her an opportunity of throwing off the oppression to which she is now subject, this would seem the most favorable. The army is not properly equipped for an invasion of an enemy's territory. It lacks much of the material of war, is feeble in transportation, the animals being much reduced, and the men are poorly provided with clothes and in thousands of instances are destitute of shoes. Still, we cannot afford to be idle and though weaker than our opponents in men and military equipments, must endeavor to harass if we cannot destroy them. I am aware that the movement is attended with much risk, yet I do not consider success impossible and shall endeavor to guard it from loss. I beg you will instruct the Ordnance Department to spare no pains in manufacturing a sufficient amount of the best kind, and to be particular in preparing that for the artillery to provide three times as much of the long-range ammunition as of that for smooth bore or short-range guns. Robert E. Lee after the battle. We must expect reverses, even defeats. They are sent to teach us wisdom and prudence, to call forth greater energies and to prevent our falling into greater disasters. George McClellan before the battle. I have the whole rebel force in front of me. I think Lee has made a gross mistake and that he will be severely punished for it. I have all the plans of the rebels and will catch them in their own trap if my men are equal to the emergency. I now feel that I can count on them as of old. George McClellan, after the battle. Those in whose judgment I rely tell me that I fought the battle splendidly and that it was a masterpiece of art. I feel some little pride in having, with a beaten and demoralized army, defeated Lee so utterly. Well, one of these days history will I trust do me justice. The spectacle yesterday was the grandest I could conceive of. Nothing could be more sublime. I am well nigh tired out by anxiety and want of sleep. Reverend Theodore Gerrish from Company H of the 20th Maine Regiment made a graphic description of the great battle. Burnside's men are exhausted. Their ranks are sadly thinned. Each regiment is but a shattered wreck. If his command could only be inspired with reinforcements. A cloud of dust is seen rolling from the rebel center to their right. Lee has seen his danger and A.P. Hill is hastening down to reinforce Longstreet to check and crush Burnside. And look up the dusty highway, his horse covered with foam, dashes a staff officer from Burnside to McClellan. Burnside says send him men and guns and he will sweep all before him, but without reinforcements, he cannot hold the position he has gained. Will McClellan grant his request? 15,000 reinforcements for Burnside means the overthrow of both Longstreet and Hill. They will be hurled back upon the center and the rebel army will be enclosed between the forces of Burnside and Sumner. The fords of the Potomac will be in our possession, and Antietam will be the deathbed of the Confederacy. For a moment, McClellan hesitates. He is loyal, but too timid and slow for a great commander. Tell Burnside to hold on. It is the greatest battle of the war. I will send him a battery. I have no infantry to send. If he is driven back, he must hold the bridge. For if we lose that, we lose all. The fatal mistake has been made. Burnside is overpowered and slowly relinquishes the ground he has gained, but the rebels have been so roughly handled, they do not press him far. They halt, the firing ceases, Burnside holds the bridge, and darkness conceals the situation from our view. Abiel Hall Edwards was an enlisted soldier from 10th Maine Regiment. Letter to his wife. It is sad to think that they have entered Maryland, but so it is. They have crossed but a few miles above us with a heavy force estimated at 60,000 and now are coming sick this way. In a short time, our little regiment will in all probability be in hard battle, but we are ready for them. The boys are all waiting with determination to fight and to conquer or die, for defeat here would be worse than death. He fell on the bloody field of Antietam close to my side, his blood flying over me in his death struggle. Such, Anna, is the daily scenes this terrible war presents. If all the agony was confined to the battlefield, no, there is broken hearts at home, homes made desolate by this cruel war. 
Robert Kellogg, 14th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry. This has been indeed a fearful day, and it is by God's kindness alone that I am here to write this. We woke up early in the morning, I went out and read the Bible and a prayer. In a few minutes, the enemy began to throw shells at us from a battery, which they had planted near us, killing several of the 8th CV. The shells burst all around and in us. Our chaplain had his coat pocket torn by a fragment of shell. I was wounded in the arm. After lying in the woods a while, we were formed and marched about two mile over hills and through valleys, fording a river about knee deep. Here we had to lie down under the bursting of the enemy's shells. While we were lying here, we were suddenly ordered to come to attention. As we were obeying this order, a most terrific volley was fired into us. Speans, Maxwell, Willie, Tallcut, Pees, and many others of Corps A were here wounded. It is said that the rebels carried the American flag and called to us, don't fire on your own. The battery soon was withdrawn, and we with the 11th CV were marched off the field some distance beyond the hospital when we formed and rested for the night, came back and laid down to sleep. Thus ended our first day of battle, and a fearful one it was. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Sandy Pendleton, 2nd Corps Staff, Army of Northern Virginia. Such a storm of balls I never conceived it possible for men to live through. Shot and shells shrieking and crashing, canister and bullets whistling and hissing most fiend-like through the air until you could almost see them. In that mile's ride, I never expected to come back alive. Private Josiah D. Hicks, Company K, 125th Pennsylvania. Under the dark shade of a towering oak near the Dunker Church lay the lifeless form of a drummer boy, apparently not more than seventeen years of age, flaxen hair and eyes of blue, and form of delicate mold. As I approached him I stooped down, and as I did so, I perceived a bloody mark upon his forehead. It showed where the leaden messenger of death had produced the wound that caused his death. His lips were compressed, his eyes half open, a bright smile played upon his countenance. By his side lay his tenor drum, never to be tapped again. Major General Joseph Hooker. In the time that I am writing, every stalk of corn in the northern and greater part of the field was cut as closely as could have been done with a knife, and the slain lay in rows precisely as they had stood in their ranks a few moments before. It was never my fortune to witness a more bloody, dismal battlefield. Account from an unknown soldier. At the Battle of Antietam, as one of the regiments was for the second time going into the conflict, a soldier staggered. It was from no wound, but in the group of dying and dead through which they were passing, he saw his father, of another regiment, lying dead. A wounded man, who knew them both, pointed to the father's corpse, and then upwards, saying only, It is all right with him. Onward went the son, by his father's corpse, to do his duty in the line, which, with bayonets fixed, advanced upon the enemy. When the battle was over, he came back, and with other help buried his father. From his person he took the only thing he had, a Bible given to the father years before, when he was an apprentice. General James Longstreet remembers the battle, visiting Antietam in 1893. On the forenoon of the 15th, the blue uniforms of the Federals appeared among the trees that crowned the heights on the eastern bank of the Antietam. The number increased, and larger and larger grew the field of the blue, until it seemed to stretch as far as the eye could see and from the tops of the mountains down to the edges of the stream gathered the great army of McClellan. General Lee had a certain respect for General McClellan, who had been his subordinate in the old engineers. But I judged that this feeling assumed somewhat the shape of patronage, like that of a father toward a son. He never feared any unexpected displays of strategy or aggressiveness on the part of McClellan, and in dealing with him always seemed confident that, on the Federals' part, there would be no departure from the rules of war as laid down in the books. We learned that McClellan was only dangerous by reason of his superior numbers. Like General Lee, he was greatly learned in the theory and science of war. He knew how to fight a defensive battle fairly well, but in offensive tactics he was timid and vacillating and totally lacking in vigor. In these particulars he was diametrically the opposite of Lee. McClellan instinctively overestimated his enemy and underestimated his own resources to meet the enemy. He was always planning, it seems to me, of the necessities in case of defeat, not with a view to victory. Union Major Rufus R. Dawes, 6th Wisconsin. At the very farthest point of advance on the turnpike, Captain Werner von Bachel, commanding Company F, was shot dead. Captain Bachel was an ex-officer of the French Army. Brought up as a soldier in the Napoleonic school, he was imbued with the doctrine of fatalism. His soldierly qualities commanded the respect of all, and his loss was deeply felt in the regiment. 
Bichel had a fine Newfoundland dog, which had been trained to perform military salutes and many other remarkable things. In camp, on the march, and in the line of battle, this dog was his constant companion. The dog was by his side when he fell. Our line of men left the body when they retreated. But the dog stayed with his dead master, and was found on the morning of the 19th of September, lying dead upon his body. We buried him with his master. So far as we knew, no family or friends mourned for poor Bachel, and it is probable that he was joined in death by his most devoted friend on earth. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and press likes.